always an easy target, right? 629, supreme indeed is the mean of the virtue, but for a long time it has been rare among the people. Um, eight, nine, the people may be made to follow something, but may not be made to understand it. Even Confucius uh, did not claim to be a gentleman himself. At 733, he says, in making an effort, I am comparable with others. But as to myself, being a gentleman in practice, I have never yet managed to achieve that. So even Confucius himself suggests it to take the grade, yet um, certainly um, he talks about having to, he talks about gentlemen, and he talks about examples of gentlemen in his own circle. So here we're going to just talk about um, some of the ways in which the gentleman is referred to, some of the qualities or attributes of the gentleman. Um, so first of all, I think importantly, and we'll come back to this in our discussion of the family at the end of my comment, right? It's beginning at the beginning and locally. One section two, the gentleman concerns himself with the root. And if the root is firmly planted, the way grows. Filial piety and fraternity, <coughs> surely they are the roots of humanity. So um, one of the ways we might say is that justice begins at home, right? Or uh, the idea is that you are the first um, terrain for the development of uh, your character is how you deal with those folks who are in the household, right? So the household is really the, the grounds on which you develop your moral flourishing and it's on the basis of the household then that you can go out into the community. So um, you can see a very different um, prioritizing of the private and the public than what we found in Aristotle, for example. Um, the gentleman also will disregard material comfort, right? 114, the gentleman avoids seeking to satisfy his appetite to the full when he eats and avoids seeking comfort when he eats at home. Again, at 611, a man of quality indeed was we. He lived in a squalid alley with a tiny bowl full of rice to eat and a ladle full of water to drink. Other men did not endure such hardships, but we did not let his happiness be affected. A man of quality indeed was we. Um, so again, various quotes suggesting that um, material um, comforts are not to be valued. Um, in addition, is the question of how much importance one ascribes to recognition and honors from others. Um, and again, an important quote, I think, at um, one seven is this notion of, um, of uh, not uh, placing too much in, in uh, the in what others think of, of you at 116. One does not worry about the fact that other people do not appreciate one. One worries about not appreciating other people. And again, going back, I repeat that quote that I said before. At 1521, the master said, what the gentleman seeks in himself, the small man seeks in others. Right? So while it is a socially embedded framework, there's a strong question of the reverence for others and the notion of being, um, there's almost a sense of a sort of religious piety being placed on our role and our place in our relationship with other people and we treat um, our interactions with other people in sort of a hallowed way, um, but that doesn't mean, at least from these quotes, that um, honor should be overly privilege or prize. Um, a fourth point is the notion that um, one needs to pay attention to people's actions as uh, the sort of mark of their characters rather than their words. Right? That actions speak louder than words. But often people can be duplicitous in the sense that often people's words can um, betray them, but at least, uh, often words can give you one um, image, but in fact they don't correspond to the reality 
of what um, the person is. So, and he says, at 510, first of all, when I dealt with people having listened to the words, I took their deeds on trust, right? But now, when I deal with people having listened to their words, I observe their deeds. In other words, uh, your point is that you should you just came to an understanding that one has to go beyond the words and see what people do rather than just trust um, what they say. Um, and again, 1427, the gentleman is ashamed that his words have outstripped his deeds. In other words, as a person of quality in the Confucian um, framework, you always have to be careful, right, to match yourself to your words. Let your words um, beyond yourself, right? So let your words outstrip your deeds. So again, at 114, the gentleman is diligent in deed and cautious in words. So you often get this um, notion. It's repeated um, in various other places in the analysts where uh, this notion that if you're in a society in which the way is followed, you can uh, more clearly um, represent yourself as an act in society, but when you're in a society where the way is not followed, you have to be prudent in your speech, cautious of work. There's, there's some various circumstances in the text um, indications where a um, cultivated individual will take their words very seriously and will um, think before they speak, I guess. Um, so, um, Again, related to that, but slightly different, is uh, be trustworthy, always be sincere in your speech, speaking in good faith at 1 age and at 7 to 25. Um, also, uh, the sixth point is to seek out the good company of the wild, right? So at 1 age, the gentleman has no friends who are not up to his own standard. Um, of course, implicit in this is the centrality of friendship for the development of um, moral character, um, but not quite in the way that Aristotle suggests, right? Whereby friendships are ways in which we exercise generosity. It's almost the way of, you know, friends have to be there in order that we, um, in a sort of, there's a sort of instrumental element of that, although there is a higher form of friendship for Aristotle where each acknowledges the good qualities of the other and becomes sort of a mirror to oneself. Um, but when thinking about Aristotle in relationship to Confucius, Aristotle still in many ways appears to be more individual-centered in a sense. Um, if you, there's a sort of curious Reflection on friendship at 16.4, where we find the phrase, there are three kinds of friendship which are beneficial, and three kinds of friendship which are harmful. It is beneficial to make friends with the upright, to make friends with the sincere, and to make friends with those who have heard many things. It is harmful to make friends with the ingratiating, to make friends with those who are good at seeming quiet, and to make friends with those who have a ready tongue. There's a lot of interesting things in that quote because it's not what you might think obviously, right? You might think obviously, well, it's good to make friends with people who have good character, it's bad to make friends with people who have bad. Well, this is not what Confucius is saying, right? Okay, it is good to make friends with friends who are upright. There's a saying where you see the good character in the other, but also with the sincere, right? Sincerity as important for friendship, partly, presumably, is to have a more truthful dialogue. Uh, but also to make friends with those who have heard many things. What sort of things? Does it mean friends who are knowledgeable or friends who, who are, are more plugged in than you are? Right? And harmful to make friends with the ingratiating, right? The idea is you um, <coughs> shouldn't make friends with those who are flattered, right? The friends who are um, using their words excessively, right? To, to, to be pleasing. Um, it's harmful to make friends with those who are good at seeming quiet, right? So in some ways you want friends to resist you. You don't always want friends that are too flexible. 
bending at every suggestion, um, but harmful to make friends with those who have a ready tongue. Right? Again, the word, right? There's an interesting, um, often coming back to language and how speech can be dangerous. Seventh, uh, seventh point, um, in social contact, seek to uh, better others. At 1216, the gentleman brings to completion the fine qualities in others and does not bring to completion the bad qualities in others. The small man does the opposite of this. Right? We might, um, our probably our Western equivalent or English equivalent would be to say that the um, the person of quality brings out the good in others. Eighth point to charm conflict um, at 3 7, right? There's nothing which gentlemen compete over. If competition were inevitable, it would be an archery, wouldn't it? But they go up bowing and making way for each other, and when they come down, they have a drink. So even in their competition with each other, they are gentlemen. Civility um, and the conflict is not um, is not represented or enacted in a dramatic way. Um, uh, now I'm showing proper reverence and social ceremony towards uh, those in authority. Five sixteen. The master said there were four of the ways of the gentleman present in Sichuan. In his conduct of himself, he was courteous. In his service of his superiors, he showed veneration. In his provision for the needs of the people, he was generous. And in his employment of the people, he was righteous. Right? So um, again, right, this, this interesting, perhaps problematic quality, but certainly very uh, long associated with Confucius and Confucianism, right, is this notion of veneration towards um, superiors, the notion of a certain um, respect, right, for, for authority. Um, but still, uh, a certain avoidance of excessive attachment to social, um, social rules. Again, the quotes from um, 4, 10, and 6, 18. Um, and finally, the, the notion of cultural refinement in 8, 8, um, affected by beauty. So let's uh, move on to looking at some of the key concepts in Confucianism. And here I just want to focus on two of them, and that is the rights. Um, Rights are, I guess, another word for ceremony, right? Um, the Chinese word being Li. And for some Confucians, this notion of the rights, which are sometimes acknowledged as um, basic practices and ceremonies that are used to um, signify, or at least to, to um, A sort of theatrical representation um, and, and practices which demonstrate important aspects of life. So one of the aspects of the rites that is involved in this discussion with Confucianism is what is sometimes called ancestor worship, right? So uh, there are certain practices in what, that one follows when uh, someone dies, and then there's a shrine that's placed in um, the household after the death of the individual, and various things are put on uh, the shrine, and it signifies the continuity of respect um, for those in the family who have passed on um, before. That's just one aspect of the rites. In ancient China, there was a whole slew of social practices that were, um, had very specific rules of behavior about it. So funerals, for example, very key moments in life where um, there were practices that had to be followed <coughs> and there were rules written 
out in very precise <coughs> way what one had to wear, when one had to bow, how one had to act, and so on. And so Confucius is someone who 